From the heart.org Medscape Cardiology, this is the Bob Harrington Show. Dr. Robert Harrington is the Arthur L. Bloomfield Professor and Chair of Medicine at Stanford University. Hi, this is Bob Harrington from Stanford University here on the heart.org and Medscape Cardiology. It's time for our annual review of the hot issues in clinical research that have affected or have really influenced cardiovascular medicine in 2019. As we've done in the last couple of years, I'm really pleased and honored to be joined by my good friend and colleague, Dr. Mike Gibson, today. Mike is a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. He is an interventional cardiologist at the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston, and he serves as the director of the BAME Institute. Mike, thanks for joining us here on Medscape Cardiology. Always a highlight of the year to be back. You know, Mike, you and I were saying before we got on the air here that, wow, there's a lot of trials to cover. And for an area where people have been wondering if there are any new things coming out, 2019 certainly seems to disprove that. There's a lot of new stuff coming with, I I would say, more things focusing on strategy than new drugs. But we do have some new drugs to talk about. We do. And when we were at ESC, I said, wow, cardiology is back. It's like we're back in the 90s again. It's exciting and a lot of highly anticipated trials and results and some new drugs, like you said. Yeah, I think it's going to be a fun conversation. And Mike, if this water sounds good for you, what we'll do is we'll talk about revascularization and the management of coronary disease. We'll talk about lipids and we'll wrap this segment up, part one, with antithrombotics. Does that seem like a reasonable approach? Sounds good. All right. Well, certainly one of the most hotly anticipated and awaited trials of the year was the ischemia trial. And ischemia is certainly a trial that you and I know well. You served on the DSMB through the NHLBI, and I served on the executive committee of the trial. So you had the interesting perspective of having observed the data over the many, many years of the trial. So why don't you describe the trial, Mike, just briefly, and then let's get into a discussion about it. Yeah, I think it was highly anticipated, but I got to say, at the end of the day, I wasn't all that surprised. I mean, we knew that PCI improved symptoms, but in the stable setting, probably wasn't going to improve death or heart attack, and I think that's what we saw here. Of course, this trial builds upon what we knew from Courage. Courage is 12 years old now, done back in 2007. Wow, time passes. Time passes. New devices and new drugs. This was in an era where we largely had bare metal stents. We now have drug-eluting stents. We have better different pharmacotherapy as well. As you know, Bob, 2,200-plus patients, no difference in death or non-fatal MI. People were randomized after angiography in that study. After angiography, people always said, well, maybe that biased the results a bit. A fair amount of crossover in the study. And importantly, back in 2014, there was a sub-study that said, if you had more ischemia, you might have more benefit. And of course, that laid the groundwork for the ischemia trial, comparing an invasive therapy or strategy with optimal medical therapy. Everyone, by the way, got optimal medical therapy. Important to note here for the audience, this is stable heart disease. This is not ACS. This is not STEMI. This is stable heart disease. And you had to have moderate to severe ischemia. And that was ischemia of greater than 10% on a nuclear scan or greater than three segments on an echo or greater than 12% on MRI. Also very important to know, this study excluded people with left main disease, and CT was used to diagnose that. And again, no ACS, no recent MI, ejection fractions above 35%. And if you were in the invasive group, you underwent angiography and had PCI or cabbage, but if you're in the medical therapy group, you only underwent angiography for failure of medical therapy. Big trial, 5,000 plus patients, followed up for 3.3 years. 
What was interesting to me was the angina frequency, and I'm going to circle back to this at the end. Yep. 34% of people had no angina. And if this procedure reduces angina as its only benefit, you got to wonder about the third of people out there who are getting nuclear stress tests on an annual basis as screening tests. Is that really going to be viable moving forward? Fair amount of crossover, 28% in the medical group ended up with the calf. And primary outcome was cardiovascular death, MI, or hospitalization for unstable angina, heart failure, or resuscitated cardiac arrest. A bit of a tempest in a teapot about the change in the primary endpoint. It's important to note that this was pre-specified, uh, this kind of endpoint, prior to the initiation of the trial in anticipation of a lower than expected event rate. And I think it was perfectly reasonable to make that change. And the primary outcome occurred in 13.3% of the routine invasive group, 15.5% of the medical therapy group, non-significant. And here's what was interesting, Bob, sitting there staring at this over the years. You got to look at the figure from the study. And in that first year, that first six months, there was harm. There was about a 2% absolute increase in the first six months with the invasive strategy. So you can uh, imagine my thoughts looking at the early data and what was going on in that early period of the study. Now the lines cross over around uh, two years so that the invasive strategy starts to have lower events. So the rule that you have to have proportional or constant hazards throughout the study was violated, and some of the traditional statistical techniques may not be appropriate. But for the secondary outcome, everyone always wants to know about death or MI. 11% in the invasive group, 13.9% in the medical therapy group, not different. All cause of death, nearly superimposable. Periprocedural MI, obviously higher with the invasive strategy, about 2.9 times higher in the invasive strategy. But on the other hand, spontaneous MI, as you might expect, was lower in the invasive strategy by about 33%. So when you put it all together, though, those two kind of balance out, and there's no difference in those hard outcomes. Quality of life, though, was better in the interventional group. But this improvement was seen in those with either daily weekly or monthly angina. It wasn't seen in those people, obviously, without angina. Really no heterogeneity in the treatment effect. It didn't matter how much ischemia you had. The results were similar. Very low rates of events in the trial. The odds of seeing something bigger than 10% in this study were less than 10% using a Bayesian analysis. So it's highly unlikely that we missed a signal that was bigger than a 10% relative benefit. It was unblinded. There was no sham procedure. Again, you have to emphasize who this applies to. It only applies to stable patients. It doesn't apply to ACS patients. Uh, really, the benefit was in the symptomatic patients. No left main disease, no heart failure. So I kind of thought this was what I expected, to be honest. I think the loser here, though, are those people who are doing a lot of annual screening surveillance stress tests in asymptomatic patients. I'm not sure that that is going to yield a clinical benefit because there was no benefit in death MI and the heart outcomes, and the only benefit was in symptoms. If you have no symptoms, we can't make you less symptomatic. I had certain beliefs going into this, as did you, but now we actually have data that cements what those observations might have been. And I take away from it, what I usually ask about a medical procedure or medical therapy is, is it going to make my patient live longer, feel better, or avoid unpleasant experiences like rehospitalization, heart attacks, heart failure episode, et cetera? And the answer for live longer is no. The answer for decreased heart attacks, rehospitalization, et cetera, is no. But feel better? The answer is yes. 
but you can only feel better if you felt bad to begin with, as you've said. And so it does really say that for the asymptomatic patient, even with an abnormal stress test, that they can be medically managed. I took away from it a couple other things, Mike. The medical therapy here was very good, but still room to go. And I took that as an encouraging sign that we still have some improvement in medical therapy, despite the fact that it was pretty good here. I think you've nicely said that this raises a lot of question around the role of imaging. I will say that one of my pretest biases was that if you had a lot of ischemia or if you had multivessel disease, you were more likely to benefit from a revascularization approach than medical therapy alone, and that doesn't appear to be true. That changes a little bit of how I think about this group of patients. I too, Mike, like you, have raised questions about the role of imaging. I like stress testing for a lot of reasons in terms of how far did you go, what heart rate did you achieve, what happened to your blood pressure during exercise. It helps me tailor my medical therapy. But one of the key questions is, is do you need to get imaging in this group of patients to accompany stress testing, or is just getting the physiologic parameters enough? And I think that's an important discussion to have. And then finally, Mike, do you think that people need a cardiac CT? to rule out left main disease or establish the diagnosis of non-obstructive disease. Any thoughts on that? One of the winners here was the CT. I put a poll up on Twitter. It was interesting. People seem to be gravitating back towards the anatomic assessment with CT and pulling back a bit from the functional or physiologic assessment on the ischemia side. So I thought that was a an interesting pivot in terms of people's perspective. It wasn't a big difference, but really the anatomic assessment, CT, had pulled ahead. Yeah, it may not be a bad approach for a patient with stable ischemic heart disease to say, look, let's get cardiac CT, rule out left main disease, and assuming there's no left main disease, let's embark upon a really aggressive course of medical therapy. If your symptoms go away and you're doing well, let's manage you that way. Would that be a reasonable approach, Mike? I think so. And then the other thing I have to say is, you know me, I've always been a fan of the microvasculature. And it's really interesting to see that being increasingly recognized for playing a big role. It's not all about bad plumbing. There's also a lot of ischemia that's mediated by the downstream microvasculature. If I had to guess, and I do know some studies coming along, you're going to see a resurgence in interest in not treating the epicardial vessels, but in treating the microvasculature, particularly in women with non-obstructive disease. As you know, there's a parallel sub-study funded by NHLBI looking at that group of patients who ended up having non-obstructive disease and not randomized, and so more to come on that group. I agree with you. I'm glad you brought it up. Mike, let's move to a different study, complete ST elevation MI, and the question has always been, you open the culprit, you got other disease, what do you do? And the guidelines have told us that unless they're in cardiogenic shock, you just handle the culprit and leave them alone. Get out of the lab and don't treat the others at that time or during that hospitalization. This turns that around, doesn't it? What's interesting is that was what the guidelines said, but I write the chapter and up to date on this stuff. When you look at the data, really when you look at culprit shock, running around and dilating all the vessels was not a good idea. It was not a good idea, that's right. You know, that was actually bad. And so uh, at things that gravitated towards a contraindication in a shock setting, contrary to the clinical practice, and then there were were some small, modest-sized trials and observational data, a lot of observational data saying we should be dilating the non-culprit vessels, but that was highly confounded. So this was a much larger study, 4,000-plus patients, 140 centers, open label, but the outcomes were assessed blindly. Two strategies, completely revascularize. Even if you don't think there was ischemia, you would revascularize a non-culprit artery if it was 70% blocked. In that intermediate 50 to 60% range, you did an FFR, and if that was positive, you revascularized. The other strategy was just leave everything alone and only revascularize the culprit vessel. Most of this was done right on the first day during the initial hospital day. That was about two-thirds of the patients. But importantly, Bob, about a third of the patients came back later for the procedure at about 23 days. About 4% crossover, so not a lot of crossover. About three quarters of people had just one other vessel treated, and the primary outcome was 
death from cardiovascular disease or new MI. It was 7.8% in the complete revest group, 105 in the culprit only group. That's a pretty big absolute risk reduction of 2.7%. You'd really only need to do about 30 procedures to prevent one of those bad events. And what was interesting is that the benefit was driven by a reduction in new MI, but obviously not in the culprit vessel over in more the non-culprit territories, and it was late. It wasn't immediate. It was later on during follow-up. No difference in death. When you look at MI death revast, 16.7% in culprit only gets reduced down to 8.9% with complete revascularization. No difference whether you did it early or late. No difference in bleeding, stroke, stent thrombosis. I was surprised, to be honest. I thought after culprit shock, it was not going to be a good idea to do all this. But I guess I've changed my mind seeing the results here. Well, Mike, maybe does it build on the ischemia comment that you made about moving the world back to anatomy? And the anatomy seems to be pretty important, and it seems to be pretty important to treat the lesions that appeared angiographically significant because the complete results, to me, look pretty compelling. Yeah, I agree. And it may not be that we are improving ischemia in this study. It may be that STEMI is a marker of plaque rupture, And if you have all these other lesions, you are clearly someone at risk for more plaque rupture. And what we're doing is perhaps preventing that plaque rupture. I'm not sure it's really an ischemia benefit, but more of a plaque rupture prevention strategy, which bears fruit late, interestingly enough. It's interesting you say that, Mike. That would sort of like take us back to the past, right? Rick Kuntz talked about that years ago, if you remember, and whether or not you should be stenting more of a blood vessel in order to prevent later events. So it is interesting how what were older ideas now with improved stent technologies, improved medical technologies, may actually come back to the forefront for us to think about. It was in the mid to late 90s where we measured in thousands of people the distance from the ostium to the lesion. And most of these lesions that behaved poorly were pretty proximal. And yeah, no, I remember those stage. papers. Yeah, that set the stage for the idea of maybe we should be passivating the lesion and preemptively stending. That never really took off, but an interesting concept. Well, Mike, let's move from revascularization to preventing events and preventive cardiology. We had said at the outset, exciting year, not just for confirmation of strategies like ischemia and complete, but some new drugs. Let's first talk about the Orion trials with Inclizoran, and there's a series of them, so we don't have to go through the trials, but the concept is really an interesting one. We know that PCSK9 inhibition with antibody-based strategies improves clinical outcomes, but now we have a whole new way of delivering a PCSK9 inhibitor. You want to talk a little bit about that? The LDL hypothesis, and I wouldn't even call it a hypothesis anymore. I may inflame people by saying that, but the LDL and outcomes relationship was really rooted in statin therapy. And the big question was, is it just about LDL or is it about the way you get your LDL lowered? And we learned from Improve It with a non-statin drug like azetamide, it fell on that curve. In other words, It's not about the drug, it's about the LDL lowering. And of course, as you mentioned, Bob, another class of drugs have come along, the PCSK9 inhibitors, which lower LDL in a different way and have yielded benefit on top of aggressive LDL lowering. That's great, but the two drugs so far are antibodies. They tend to require dosing either every other week or once a month, so a lot of injections and the cost has been very high. And the cost of goods when you have an antibody is quite high. And glycerin is very exciting, not just because it's a drug that lowers LDL, but it's a drug that actually is a whole new class of drugs. It's a interfering RNA-based technology. A way to think about this is the antibodies, they're kind of mopping up all of the excess PCSK9. What inclycerin is doing is turning off the sink and preventing it from spilling over. So a different way of down-regulating the amount of PCSK9 in your body. Here's the exciting thing. 
the drug has a long biologic half-life and you can inject it twice a year and get an LDL lowering in all these studies of about 55, 58%. Now here's a number that I've heard and I haven't seen it published yet. If you inject once a year, you can still achieve LDL lowering of 45 to 48%. I wanna see that number published, but Bob, that would be amazing uh, to be able to have people come either twice a year or once a year and achieve that kind of LDL lowering on top of statin therapy. From a public health perspective, it's, it's kind of amazing. Now, Mike, with the recent data we saw at the AHA, we're starting to see longer-term safety data, which had been one of the remaining questions with the IRNA approach. Of course, we don't have the clinical outcomes yet. That's certainly a cautionary tale, but I think, as you've noted, it is a different mechanism of inhibiting PCSK9, but we know that PCSK9 is a validated target at this point, and the clinical outcome studies are being done, and the conservative trialist in me says we have to await those, but I think this could be a major change in how we think from a public health perspective. Yeah, and the safety now 3,000 patient years worth of exposure plus looking like there's no liver side effects or other toxicity, that's looking good. My son always teases me. He's a quantitative genomicist, and he says, Dad, what, what are you doing with all those trials? Just use Mendelian randomization to pick your targets. And he was right on this one. Nature does randomized trials. And if you're one of those people that got randomized naturally to having genes that reduce PCSK9, over a lifetime, not a couple of years, a lifetime of exposure, you have a dramatic reduction in risk. And this raises the next question. He said to me, and, and this is an interesting question I pose to people, I'm in my 30s. Should I be taking statins given the lifetime exposure? Should I be taking a PCSK9 given the lifetime exposure risk to coronary artery disease? So I think one of the questions will become how far up do we back the truck in terms of primary prevention rather than just secondary prevention? That's a great question, and this certainly is a, a success story for the folks using genetically guided drug discovery and development. I'm not ready to exchange the randomized clinical trial for Mendelian randomization. We could have a whole discussion about the differences between a randomized clinical trial and Mendelian randomization, but let's move on, Mike, to the second of the exciting... Well, I'll, I'll let you argue with my son. On that. I am not arguing with your son. He is much smarter than I ever will be. He's much smarter than you and I together will ever be. Correct. Right. Let's you know, talk just, about triglycerides and reduce it. Yeah, we just talked about how it's not about the drug, it's about the LDL. Well, there are other non-LDL ways of improving outcomes potentially. Triglycerides have always been identified as a risk factor, but we've never known if modifying triglycerides would really improve outcomes. And one class of drugs that does improve triglycerides are the fish oils. There's a bunch of different types of fish oil. The one that was studied in this reduced study is a very specific one. It's highly purified form of EPA. And it's been shown to reduce triglycerides. But this study looked to see if the label could be expanded to see if there would be a reduction in heart outcomes like death or MI. There were a lot of other studies before this, but again, they used kind of over-the-counter fish oils, non-purified. They had DHA in them, uh, docosohexanoic acid. I, t I practiced that all morning, Bob. And, <laughs> Good job. Uh, this was this was uh, a different pure drug. This study was preceded by a study in uh, about 18,000 Japanese patients, which did show a 19% reduction in events. So this isn't just a study all by itself of a SEPA. You had to have a triglyceride between 150 and 499 milligrams per deciliter to get in. You had to have been on statins. So this is on top of statins. It was randomized. It was double blind. It was placebo controlled and what they used as the placebo was mineral oil. That matched the consistency uh, of the fish oil or the EPA in the color. But there have been questions raised about that. We'll get back to that in a minute. Lots of centers around the world, uh, 4.9 years of follow-up. 
Vasepa did what it was supposed to do, lowered triglycerides by 18.3%. But what is interesting is LDL went up a little bit in the Vasepa group, 3.1%, but it went up 10.2% in the mineral oil placebo group. And people said, aha, this blocked the absorption of the statin the mineral oil did, and that was just why the SEPA won. But at the end of the day, we'll talk a little more about that. That's probably not the case. The SEPA did lower the pre-specified primary endpoint from 22% down to 7.2%, lowered death MI stroke from 14.8% down to 11.2%, again, on top of statins. There was a guy who was a cardiologist and chief or chairman of medicine at the Mass General, who I used to work with out at the West Rocks VA, who showed that these drugs in dogs reduced arrhythmias. And in my mind, it was not surprising that adjudicated sudden death and cardiac arrest were reduced. Now, there was surprisingly a little higher rate of AFib. Mostly it was people who had AFib in the past had a higher rate of it and that was 5.3% versus 3.9%. A little more bleeding, and these are kind of the kinds of issues that will need to be dealt with in the label. But at the end of the day, the FDA advisory panel met about this and examined the issue of mineral oil, and the small rise in LDL that does not seem to be sufficient to account for the 25% reduction in events. As you in the audience know, Bob, the advisory panel, and it's an advisory panel, advised the FDA that the label should be expanded by a vote of 16 to 0. We have another tool at our disposal. This is a field that there's been a lot more hype and hope than there had been definitive data. But now, as you've nicely described, we have a well-designed, a well-carried-out study with clear clinical outcome benefits. The question about the mineral oil was something certainly I had discussed when I first saw the results. As you said, LDL goes up. You didn't mention, but also noted, was that CRP went up. A lot, so the, by 30 the, some percent. Yeah, there were some inflammatory markers. And so the question was, geez, was this an unfair test of an active placebo that was potentially deleterious against the drug? And in fact, as you've noted, a lot of analyses were done that said even an active non-inert placebo couldn't account for the difference between them. And the advisory committee voted to uh, extend the label. So I do agree with you. I think that this is going to be a new tool in the tool chest for our patients with hypertriglyceride. So important trial of 2019. Let's finish, Mike, with a conversation in this section on antithrombotics, an area that you and I have spent much of the last 30 years working on. And I want to uh, focus on two, Augustus and Twilight. Let's do Augustus first. I think that'll be quick. This is one of many studies now that have been done trying to understand the optimal combination of antithrombotic therapy in that group of your patients who have both need for dual antiplatelet therapy and need for anticoagulant. Can we peel away one of the antiplatelet agents and still give patients good anti-ischemic protection while protecting them against the risk of stroke with their atrial fibrillation. How did you interpret Augustus, Mike? Because you've been involved with this field in other studies, and I think that the results of Augustus are very consistent with the other studies. Yeah, the results are entirely consistent. I do think, as I always say, and as you've seen my slide, Bob, there's about 2.8 million ways to combine all these drugs, and we're trying to bring some order to all this madness. At the end of the day, it looks like Augustus shows what all the other studies show, namely that combining a NOAC with a thionopyridine reduces the risk of bleeding clearly compared to any kind of form of triple therapy. And by triple therapy, I mean DAPT plus an anticoagulant, often warfarin. So we've done meta-analyses now. We've done a lot of different analyses, lumping together all the data, and the message is very consistent. You get a significant reduction in bleeding, and when you look at the risk of ischemia, does it go up? And when we look at death and my stroke, the point estimate is 1, 1.0, no difference when you lump all the studies together. 
in a bivariate analysis, the upper limit of that confidence interval is only 1.13. So we are fairly confident at this point that there's no excess risk of ischemic events when you drop largely aspirin from these studies and continue on with just an anticoagulant and a thionopyridine. Yeah, and that seems to me to be an important clinical observation that we all had struggled for a long time of what do you do, how do you risk stratify, and put them on the triple therapy for as short a period of time as possible. I think you're right, Mike. Now we got really good evidence from across studies. This is one where you have to look at the totality of the data, that the novel anticoagulant plus the ADP inhibitor appears the way to go. Another trial, Mike, that really challenged the notion of combination therapy versus more monotherapy was Twilight, which ended up being one of the big hits of the TCT 2019 conference. You want to talk about Twilight? Yeah, it's fascinating. When you and I were younger, remember what we used to do? We used to put in 10 French sheaths for atherectomy and then put a stent in. We would give dextran, heparin, coumadin, aspirin, and persantine. Yes. I mean, it was, it was insane. And leave the sheath in for days. <laughs> a day, yeah. I mean, my gosh. And then came along stars, and ticlopidine and aspirin turned out to be much better than all of that, reducing bleeding, and looked to have very good ischemic outcomes as well. Of course, ticlopidine was replaced by clopidogrel. And here's the point that's so fascinating to me. What we did over the next two decades is we said, okay, aspirin's our foundational therapy. Do all these new things like clopidogrel, prazogrel, and ticagrelor, do they add to aspirin? And the answer was yes. What we never did, we never said, let's say that these drugs are better antiplatelets, the thionopyridines, and let's see if aspirin adds anything to them. And finally, for the first time on the cardiovascular side, we did that. And uh, Twilight said, does aspirin add anything to ticagrelor alone? I think that's the way I've tried to kind of characterize this. I want to be very clear in the study, and I was senior author of this, in the study, we're not saying drop aspirin right away. These people got aspirin at the time of the procedure and for three months. And these weren't STEMI patients. So high risk of bleeding and ischemic events, you continue DAP for three months, then you drop aspirin or you uh, continue aspirin. And what we found uh, is no surprise really that if you drop aspirin, which inhibits prostaglandins and causes gastric erosion and bleeding, if you drop the aspirin, you get less bleeding. And the important thing was there was no excess risk of ischemic events. The ischemic events were less frequent than we thought, but we did hit the non-inferiority criteria for ischemia. The risk of death of my stroke was 3.9% in both groups. The difference in all-cause death was 1% versus 1.3. MI, 2.7% in both risk groups. No difference in stroke or stent thrombosis. So I think this will change practice. I, you have to make an assessment about what's best for every patient individually. But for high-risk bleeding, high-risk ischemic patients, this certainly moves the needle towards shortened duration of DAP, say for three months. The results really apply to ticagrelor, not to clopidogrel and prasugrel. So those would need to be evaluated independently. I, too, saw this as a potentially practice-changing trial when I saw the results at TCT and then read the paper. We were all using things like the DAP risk calculator. We were all calculating bleeding risk and then trying to make an individualized decision, and I think that that is quite appropriate. Here we have a nice piece of data that for high bleeding risk, high ischemic risk patients, you can drop the aspirin and just continue on ticagrelor monotherapy. I think that is a step forward and will change practice as people become aware of these data. Mike, this has been a fun discussion. Let's call an end to this section. We have more to come, so we hope people will listen to the next version. But my guest has been Mike Gibson from Harvard Medical School, Beth Israel Dikas and the BAME Institute. And Mike, thanks for joining me on Medscape Cardiology for part one of Best of 2019. Cardiology is back. <laughs>